Welcome to the Sienjo Luafu and our very first taste of the Eon's influence over the lives of mortals. Sure, Bellabog mentioned the Architect faction of Klipoth and the Herta Space Station introduced us to Nanook, but in both of those locations, we were mostly focused on the Stellarons and not so much on the Eons themselves. It's only in the Sienjo Luafu that we took a step back from Stellarons and bore witness to the abilities of an Eon. Or two. In light of this, I thought now would be a great time to talk about the two eons that we're up against, Lan and Yaosha. But to do that, we'll also need to talk about the history of the Sienjo Alliance and the faction known as Sanctus Medicus. Now, this should go without saying, but if you haven't finished the currently available Sienjo Luafu story quest up through The Sinner's Misled, Credence Falsified, which is available after rank 34 as of version 1.0, then maybe set this video aside until you do that. There will be spoilers for that content. But okay, that's enough housekeeping, let's kick things off with a history lesson of the Xianzhou Alliance because literally everything else in this video hinges on this. Roughly 8,000 years ago, standard time, because you need to specify that kind of stuff in space, the people we know of as the Sienjo lived on a normal planet, but one of the Sienjo emperors desired immortality. So he ordered the construction of, at least, nine spaceships and sent them off in search of the secret of immortality. It took like 2,000 years, but eventually these ships ran into Yaoshe, the Eon of Abundance, and they blessed each ship with a mark which symbolized their newly extended lifespans, a gift from the Eon. Each ship bore a unique and distinct mark. For the Luafu, it was an enormous tree, the Ambrosial Arbor, while the Yaoqing ship had a moon. But this longevity wasn't all good news. I'm sure the people would heal quickly and typical aging was essentially non-existent, sort of, but without deaths, there was a steady growth in population that quickly became unmanageable and unsustainable. Resources became scarce and the nobility began withholding important goods like food from the general population in order to keep it for themselves. As you can imagine, this caused a great deal of civil unrest and so began a series of civil wars across all of the ships. So yeah, limited resources, overcrowding, political corruption, civil unrest, and oh, I didn't even mention the fact that the outsiders kept attacking the Sienjo, having heard they discovered the secret of immortality because these outsiders also wanted to be immortal. So yeah, things were not so great. And while all of this was happening, the true cost of Yaosha's blessing began to appear. There would come a time for every Sienjo native where they just began to change. They would become forgetful or quiet. They'd forget to eat and then have moments of lucidity before finally dissolving into pure madness, with golden branches bursting out of their skin as a sort of twisted metamorphosis took place. Those who experienced this were called the Mara Struck, people stuck in a state somewhere between life and death, like a, like a kind of zombie, if you will. They were sort of brain dead, but their bodies would just keep moving. We'll talk more about the Mara Struck a little bit later. Now, the historical texts that I'm referencing in this next little bit are written in a kind of flowery, lyrical, and poetic manner. So they're a little bit difficult to decipher, and they're kind of uh, maybe a little exaggerated. It's hard to tell. But if we assume that they are correct, then supposedly the Eon that we now know of as Lan, the Hunt, was originally a mortal Xianzhou hero on board the Xianzhou Yuan Chao. While drifting through space, the Yuan Chao encountered a race of fire spirits known as the Heliobi. This wasn't exactly an amicable encounter. See, the Heliobi are like star spirits or fire spirits, I guess? and they have the ability to manipulate or create microstars. So when the Yuan Chao encroached on their territory, the Heliobi created this red dwarf, thinking that it would capture the Yuan Chao ship. But 2,000 of the Yuan Chao soldiers, dubbed the Suicide Squad, repurposed the engine of the ship and created some kind of giant drill, which they used to drill through the red dwarf, or so the legend goes. I, I don't know how that works. I don't know how you drill through a star. It might be metaphorical. Whatever it was, it caused the star to collapse on itself and become a black hole, and the Heliobi leader, known then as the Flint Emperor, was captured in the aftermath. As I mentioned earlier, the Heliobi are flame or like energy spirits, so this Flint Emperor that they were captured was then used to power the Yuan Chao ship. 
where it reconvened with the Luafu. Aboard the Luafu, the mortal Lan used the Jade Abacus to ascertain what kind of future there could be for the Sienjo given their current Mara-struck circumstances. And that future that they saw held only suffering, if the Sienjo did nothing. So Lan petitioned the nobles to do something, but they were like, nah, we're not gonna listen to you. So that ticked Lan off, so Lan shot the Ambrosial Arbor, which did nothing, it just was out of spite. But the act itself pissed the nobles off, so they sentenced Lan to confinement within cryostasis, probably because becoming an undead Mara struck was a possibility if they tried to execute him, and Lan was like really strong, so that could end pretty badly. So yeah, Lan now in cryostasis. Many, many years passed, and the Sienjo fleet, which was now an alliance, was suddenly attacked by Yaosha's followers. To drive back this unprecedented invasion, the nobles woke the sleeping Lan, who stabilized the situation for a while, but then did something a little weird. They went into the prison of the Luafu and found that Heliobi leader we talked about earlier. And Lan struck a deal with the Flint Emperor that resulted in the Flint Emperor possessing Lan's physical body. So now Lan has a mortal physical body of a Sienjo native that's being possessed by a fire energy star spirit thing. Consensual alien body possession. Anyway, the denizens of abundance were numerous, and the Sienjo alliance was outmatched, but with Lan and the Flint Emperor in one body at the helm of one of the Sienjo ships, they drew back their bow and fired a shot that completely destroyed the Ambrosial Arbor, and, as far as I can tell, the entire invading force. One shot. And after that shot, they simply vanished. Supposedly... The combination of the Flint Emperor and Lan ascended together and became the eon known as Lan the Hunt. And ever since that day, the people of the Sienjo Alliance have sworn to follow the path set forth by Lan, hunting down the denizens of abundance and wiping out the plagues of Yaosha. But of course, not every Sienjo resident shares this outlook. There are those among the Sienjo who believe that in spite of the obvious hiccups with Yaosha's blessing, longevity is still a blessing. The idea that one could transcend sickness and suffering and even death sounds incredible in concept. And to those with advanced medical knowledge like Dan Shi, perhaps even some of the less appealing aspects, like the madness part of being Mara struck, could be overcome if given the chance. After all, the people of the Sienjo aren't the only ones who have been blessed by Yaosha. Other races like the Wing Weavers and the Borison follow Yaosha's path and seem to get along just fine, although we know very little about them. The only thing that we do know is that they're very resilient and very difficult to kill. There may be some aspect to their natural constitution that makes them better suited for Yaosha's gifts than the Sienjo, who appear to be mostly humans. Now, naturally, humans are classified as short-lived species, and short-lived species are able to adapt to new circumstances and environments rather quickly. Now, according to the book, The Pharmacological Studies of the Draught of Draconic Surge, Yash's blessing works a bit like this. At the time of birth, a sort of genetic baseline is established for every person, and while the body does age, albeit very, very slowly, all cells will continuously attempt to revert back to their baseline state. For example, if you were born blind, like the leader of Sanctus Medicus, Don Shu, you will not be able to change this aspect of yourself for any prolonged period of time. If you were to, say, undergo some surgery to help you see, it would only work for a short while before the cells in your body would reject the transplants and revert back to their baseline state of blindness. The book describes this cellular behavior as being something like cancer cells. Cancer cells differ from normal cells in a very peculiar way. Normal human cells have very specialized DNA sequences that are at the end of the chromosomes, which are called telomeres, which keep track of its cellular age and protect the chromosome itself. But as a cell continues to divide or multiply, the telomeres shorten. Eventually, the telomeres become too short, and then the cell just dies. Because, you know, the chromosomes are no longer protected. Cancer cells invert this process. They can actually lengthen the telomeres, which reverses the process of cellular death, which means that they can basically replicate indefinitely with no, you know, cell death damage, which is how you get tumors. 
Now, I think the logic behind likening Yasha's blessing to cancer comes from the idea that the normal cells in a Xianzhou native are slowly being replaced with cancerous ones, so like Yasha blessed cells. Once that cancerous cell count reaches a critical mass, the body undergoes a transformation of uncontrollable reproductive growth, so to speak. So the original baseline stat that was set at birth becomes completely overwritten, presumably by these new cancerous Yaosha cells that took over, and the body mutates, basically. And this is the phenomenon that we call being Mara-struck. Now the Mara-struck generally lose their minds, entering a somewhat undead state where they're no longer aware of anything, but their body moves like it has a will of its own, regenerating whenever it takes damage. Autopsy reports have found that people born without limbs can grow a replacement after becoming Mara-struck. This feat is impossible normally due to how Yaosha's blessing works, but the discovery caught the interest of the faction called Sanctus Medicus, who think it's possible to control the Mara-struck mutation and leverage it as a type of… evolution. Now this book, The Pharmacological Studies on the Drought of Draconic Surge, is an analysis on a medication developed by Don Shu and Sanctus Medicus. The idea behind it is pretty simple. Study the traits of other long-lived species in order to find a way to control the mutation process. And they've had some limited success. Those who take this medication, the Draught of Draconic Surge, appear to be able to retain their minds after becoming Mara-struck. This progress is what gives the faction of Sanctus Medicus hope of a true life without suffering, sickness, or death. But to understand how this medication works, we need to talk about two different types of longevity found on the Xianzhou. Now, the Eon Yaosha blessed the Xianzhou natives with longevity in a form of cellular stasis, for lack of a better term. But the Eon Long blessed the race of the Vid Yadhara with longevity in the form of constant reincarnation or regeneration. The Vid Yadhara are often called a race of dragons because some of them who manage to undergo certain rituals are able to actually transform into dragons. But rather than living forever, every Vid Yadhara is stuck in an endless cycle of death and rebirth. They therefore have no parents as they revert to the form of an egg after death and hatch anew, and they are unable to procreate. Because they are constantly dying and being reborn without memories of their previous incarnation, the Vidyadhara are able to bypass the issues that those blessed by Yausha seem to experience. Now, the Draught of Draconic Surge that was developed by Sanctus Medicus basically takes cells from the Vidyadhara people and forcefully injects them into the Mara-struck. Those draconic cells seem to be able to stabilize the Mara-struck for a time, but it's definitely not a permanent fix, as those cells will die and the Mara-struck will revert back to its mindless state. Still, progress is progress, and the leader of Sanctus Medicus is nothing if not determined to see her dream come to fruition. Now, I've mentioned her many times already, but let's talk a little bit more about Dan Shu and why she's out here trying to make Yao Shi's blessing work the way she thinks it should. The Eon Lan believed that Yaosha's blessing was an abomination. It was unnatural and caused more suffering than it prevented. Therefore, Lan ascended to Eonhood, determined to wipe out all of Yaosha's so-called abominations, and eventually Yaosha themselves. Dan Shu, the leader of Sanctus Medicus, originally aligned with the path of the hunt, same as the rest of the Xianzhou. But she had one wish in life, and that was to be able to see. She was born blind, and being one of the Yasha blessed, this meant that she would never be able to obtain sight for any prolonged period of time since her cells would constantly try to revert back to their baseline state, making her blind once again. Nevertheless, she worked tirelessly with her friend Yu Fei to find a way to make it happen. At one point, Dan Shu even underwent a transplant surgery, and while she was able to see for a very short period of time, her body eventually rejected the new eyes in the most painful way possible. Her diary, if you read it, says that she screamed into a puddle of her own blood as her newfound sight left her. That's how badly she wanted to be able to see. Not long after this failed transplant attempt, Yu Fei was conscripted into the Third Great War between the Xianzhou Alliance and the Denizens of Abundance as a field medic. There was very low risk to her life since she wasn't fighting, but Lin made an appearance on the battlefield. Yu Fei was caught in the fallout of one of their attacks, and she died. 
Don Shu was distraught and unable to properly cope with Yufei's death, she renounced Lan and the path of the hunt. Because in her eyes, if it wasn't for the hunt's endless pursuit of death, Yufei would still be alive. Now for an NPC, there's a lot of development being given to Don Shu, and I wouldn't be surprised if Yaosha spared her a glance and elevated her to the position of an emanator, which would probably mean a boss fight. But like, here's the thing that kind of bugs me about her. There's a bit of a logical fallacy when it comes to Densha, and it stems from her fundamental misunderstanding of both the Eon's paths. And by the by, neither path is good or evil here. Eons are just manifestations of the path's philosophical concept, and concepts don't have inherent morality. It's up to the individual to decide whether a concept's manifestation or application is good or evil. I feel like that disclaimer is important, but back to my point about Danshu misunderstanding both paths. Infinite life, as given by Yaosha, is unsustainable, which is why death, given by Lan, follows it wherever it goes. If you think about it, most of the suffering of the Sienjo stems from Yaosha, which is infinite life. Without that blessing, Dan Shu could have had a transplant and been able to see just like she wanted because she would have been a short-lived species that could adapt to those new transplanted eyes. There would never have been a civil war aboard all of the ships because resources wouldn't have become a problem due to overpopulation, and Lan would have never become an Eon, and Yufei likely would not have died in war but of natural causes. The mortal version of Lan likely believed that death was a natural part of life, that loss was necessary for change, that there is meaning and purpose to be found in that suffering, in that decay and death. But death is a means by which life can continue in an endless loop. Decaying matter provides substance from which new life can grow. It's a fair way to distribute resources, which makes death a part of the life cycle, right? But Don Shu doesn't believe that the hunt, or death, serves any purpose. She just sees it as needless suffering, and so she rejects it. And in doing so, she rejects a core aspect of her humanity. I think Stephen Colbert puts it really, really well. So what do you get from loss? You get awareness of other people's loss. Well, that's true. Empathy. Which allows you to connect with that other person. Right. Which allows you to love more deeply and to understand what it's like to be a human being, if it's true that all humans suffer. Right. And so, at a young age, I suffered something so that by the time I was in serious relationships in my life with friends, or with my wife or with my children is that I have some understanding that everybody is suffering and however imperfectly acknowledge their suffering and to connect with them and to love them in a deep way that not only accepts that all of us suffer but also then makes you grateful for the fact that you have suffered so that you can know that about other people and that's that's what I mean it's it's about the fullness of your humanity in other words, loss and suffering are the foundations of empathy, and empathy is one of the key pieces of what makes us human. And that's kind of visibly represented by the visual mutation of the Mara struck. And it's also exactly what Dan Shu is trying to promote. Well, that ended on a slightly heavier note than I had intended, but hey, this whole story arc is a pretty philosophical one at its core. I don't know about you guys, but I've actually been pretty impressed with the Sienjo story arc. I think it's doing a pretty good job of fleshing out the true impacts of the eons while still making the story resonate at a human level. And I'm kind of starting to think there's going to be a whole lot more to look at on a philosophical side of things going forward in the story, and I'm pretty chuffed about that, actually. I think I'm done for today though. Just want to take a quick moment to thank all of my lovely channel members for supporting me and the lore that we all adore, and I would also like to thank you for still watching this video, because you, you know we're at the end, right? Like, it's it's okay to leave. I mean, I'm gonna leave. I, I've got things to do, I've got games to play and videos to make, you know? So, this is me, awkwardly fading away into the darkness. I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna go now. Bye.